A wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus, Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Dear woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, My time has not yet come. His mother said to, his, to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone jo water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, Now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom and said, aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper one after the guests had had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. This, the first of his miraculous signs, Jesus performed at Cana in Galilee. He thus revealed his glory, and his disciples put their faith in him. This is the word of God. Reverend Mark, uh, one will come preach with a sermon titled, The Better One. So please open up your hearts and minds for the word of God. We titled the series as Crossroad because if you read the New Testament, especially the Gospels, one thing you'll find is this, that anybody who has encountered Jesus, um, there's only one of two outcomes. Either they walk away in unbelief and reject Jesus, or they become a disciple. There is never an occurrence of somebody sort of neutral. I'm not sure. I mean, uh, I'm not sure what to think. Let me just kind of be in this middle ground. Either they hate Jesus or they worship him. And so, as we go through these encounters in the Gospel of John, um, the, the ideal outcome for each of us is that we also have one of these two one or two um, scenarios play out in our own lives. And the idea is this, that if a person has met God, the Son of God Himself, how can it ever be the same again? Right? How can I go to the supermarket and meet Superman, the real Clark Kent, and not be impacted by this unbelievable meeting? Right? Even if it was Superman, or even if you met someone famous or some entertainer that you love, it's going to have an impact on your life. How much more when you meet somebody who says, I am the creator, I am the one who made you, I made everything. Um, it will be life changing. It will be the crossroad that a person will remember for the rest of their lives. So the premise is this. If being a Christian, being a follower of Jesus, has not had this crossroad impact or turning point in our lives, then we really have to look deeper into who Jesus is and whether we've really met Him. Because it is not a casual meeting that any of these people have. It is a life-changing crossroad turning point that they all have. All right, let's pray. Lord, uh, we commit the following eight weeks to studying these encounters in the Gospel of John. God, we pray that our hearts will be uh, tender, that our conscience will be opened, and Lord, that you would have your way to bring us to faith and humility and to trust in the revelations that are given to us, these signs of who Jesus is. May the magnitude uh, the tremendous revelations that are before us really take hold of us, God, and become a turning point in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, in, in a way, this wedding and this 
incident with the wine, the shortage of wine, it's sort of a picture of what life is like in this world. Um, you know, weddings were very festive occasions for Jewish people. Not just for them, but in many uh, ancient cultures. And even now, when I went to Ethiopia, what I found out was people there, we, I witnessed like three weddings in one day. Right? We were sitting by this old, uh, not old, this new uh, Orthodox uh, church there, where they have the weddings. There were like three weddings in a row that day. And I noticed that the couples were all old. Like they look like they're at least in their 40s or maybe in their 50s. And, and I asked, why are they so old? And the answer I got was, you know, the weddings are extravagant there. They hire dancers and singers, and it's like a parade. They do that, and they take that parade into the city. And it's like 30, 40 people just jumping, playing music, singing with the bride and groom, and walking through town and the church. It's like a parade. And so they don't hold anything back. They spend everything they have on that wedding. So many people can't get married, even if they have someone they love, because it's just too expensive. So they save up for 10 years, 15 years, and by the time they have money, they're in their 40s or 50s. So that's how important the wedding is. It's really not just about them, it's about blessing that whole neighborhood, that, their whole clan, their whole um, um, the front network of friends. And so it's a special occasion. It's so important. They've been saving, you know, and it's kind of like that in the Jewish culture, where it was a culture of manual labor. So most of these people never had a vacation. They never went to Disney World or even, you know, to a, a remote site where they could relax on the beach. So working with their hands, a wedding lasted typically for a week. And it was everything. You know, for them, this was the time to really relax, recuperate, connect with people. So you can imagine how special it was. And so if they ran out of wine, you know, it was a disgrace to the host, and it was a huge disappointment to the guests. And drunkenness was a disgrace in this culture, so they typically mixed the wine with water. And, but they ran out. They ran out, and according to tradition, the, the bride and groom were somewhat related to Jesus' mother, Mary. So Mary comes to Jesus and says, they, they're out of wine. they to do something. So they, well, they don't get, you know, I don't want you to have the impression this is like a frat party, right? Uh, at a college where their goal is to get everybody drunk as possible. Um, it's not like that. It, it's, it's a very, in a way, you could say it, it's a socially benevolent cause is to really celebrate the special time, give everyone sort of time off to relax and to, to enjoy each other's company, right? It was a very wholesome occasion. And so, when Jesus is approached by his mother, he gives a very abrupt answer, which in the English can be misunderstood. Right? It says, you know, uh, what do I have to do with it? Really, the, the tone from the Greek is not really translated into the English, even though the words are. It's really not an offensive statement he's making. He, he's really saying, I work now according to my father's timetable, and I will do it my way. It's sort of something like that. It's not an insult to his mother. So look at her response. She says to the servants, whatever he says to you, just do it. If he was insulting her, she would not have responded that way. So she knew, she got the message, okay, just do whatever he says to you. I don't know what he's going to do, but he's going to do something, so just listen to him. And that is the first point of emphasis in this story that we have to look at. Mary tells the servants to do whatever he says, just do it. In the ancient church, there is a saying that really originates from a theologian named Augustine, right? And he said, the faith seeking understanding is really the spiritual life. That all spiritual knowledge, all wisdom in the things of God, the starting point is faith. That once I begin to believe, I have access to understanding, wisdom, and knowledge, and everything else comes and follows. For these servants to take six jars of these uh, jars that were used to hold the water for cleansing, uh, it was a tedious task and something that sounded ridiculous.
ridiculous. Because Jesus told them to fill it up to the brim. Right? And it, it cancels out a couple of things. The fact that they fill it to the brim means that there's no room for deception. Jesus could not mix it with wine, right? In secret. Kind of like how magicians you know, trick people into magic. Right? You know, magic is all trickery, the way it's an illusion. So there's no room for that. There's no room for Jesus to mix the water with wine or put something in there. It's full. It's water or nothing. It's either he does a miracle or that's it. It's just water. It's full. And secondly, the fact that he used the water for ceremonial cleansing means that the jars were kept clean. So it was not tainted. Right? It was not a trick. And that is noted in the text. There is a scene where Peter and the disciples are in a boat, right? And there's a huge storm. The boat is turning left and right, and it's about to be capsized. And the water's coming in, and they're panicking for their life. And then in the midst of the storm, they see Jesus walking, right? And Jesus calls out to them, Do not be afraid, it is I. And the eye of the storm is Jesus. And you see something very strange. Peter says, Lord, if it is you, Command me to walk on water. So Jesus says, come. And in the gospel account, we find that Peter walks out and he begins to walk on water. Can you imagine that? Peter is walking on water like Jesus. Now, if Peter had said, Lord, um, I don't understand how, you know, according to physics, this is not possible. Let me do my calculations and see what is happening here before I take this leap of faith. But it would have never happened, right? He could never figure out how Jesus could walk on water or how, let alone how he could walk on water. The math doesn't work. He cannot understand it with reason. Nevertheless, he, called, he said, if it's you, command me to walk on water. If Jesus would command me to walk on water, even I can do it. That was his logic. That was his reasoning. That was his rationale. Because Jesus, the person, seems to have this transcendent authority over everything, if he says it, I can do it. That was reason enough. When the servants are told to go fill the water pots and to, to do whatever Jesus told them, it is something, it is an action that, that requires sort of self-denial. It's an action that requires a denial of reason, understanding, common sense even. And yet, because of the person who said it, okay, give him the benefit of the doubt, give it a shot. This is the first principle in coming to experience God, in coming to experience answer to prayer, answer to uh, faith, response to faith. In all things in Scripture, this is the key. That if we don't, if faith is not the starting point, we are in darkness. Nothing will make sense. Nothing will be revealed to us. This is a message in this first part of this text. That Jesus is the Son of God. That He changed the very element, the, the very chemical makeup of water into wine. He didn't mix something, he didn't need money, he didn't need additional resources to make this happen. He just did it. Just by sheer will. He didn't even touch the water. He says, take it to the head waiter. And if you follow the narrative carefully, it must have changed as they were taking it. Because it was water when the servants grab it. But when the head waiter tastes it, it's wine. And it's the best wine he's ever had. Not only is the first miracle of Jesus, right, this water into wine, a, a miracle that speaks about who Jesus is, it shows us a pattern in the way that Jesus does miracles in the future. Right? And this is a pattern. Jesus does miracles in the common. All right, would you repeat after me? Jesus does miracles in the common. Jesus never puts on a show. He never puts on a show. His miracles are so soft-spoken and mundane that the majority of the people around him miss it. They don't, they don't get it. They miss it because he is so discreet. He is so soft-spoken. He doesn't wave a wand. He doesn't 
you know, speak a can incantation or a spell or anything. He just tells them, go fill the water jars. Nobody else knows that Jesus performed a miracle. The only people who know there are the servants and the disciples who are next to him, who heard him say this. And they watched this subtle and almost imperceivable miracle take place. You know, in your lives, and in my life, and in the lives of God's people all around us, there are these miracles taking place every day. We don't see it. Because that's how God works. God is not a showman. God is a humble God. That's very important for us to understand. Because we, we come to God with prayers. We come to God asking for things, and we ask Him for help. We wait, we hope, but we look oftentimes in the wrong places. And we often neglect and overlook the most obvious and most commonplace answers that God has given us. He's already given it to us already. But we want something that seems to be more supernatural. We want something that seems to be more spiritual. <coughs> but God's most spiritual works in our lives takes place in the most common, in the most basic, most routine and boring relationships, responsibilities, and commitments. It is in those places where God says, look, just do this. Look, just fill the water pots. Elisha tells David, go wash in the Jordan River. He tells Abraham, Abraham, just leave your father's land to a country I will show you. For three days, Abraham is circling, wandering. God, where, where do you want me to go? I don't know where to go. I don't have a plan for my life. I have all these employees. I have this huge house. What do you want me to do? God doesn't answer. And he says, finally, after three days, go where I will point you to the land of Canaan. God works the most common areas that we never care to think about. Is God really showing me this? And the more we get trained, right, in hearing God and watching God work in the most common and basic aspects of life, the more we be in tune to God. You know, when I call home, right, you know, I have twins, and some people have a hard time telling them apart. They say, who is Paul, who is Stephen? I, can, I know who is Paul, who is Stephen, does by even the sound of their cry, the voice of their cry. So if they're in another room and somebody's crying or screaming or yelling, just by their voice, I know who's who. Because, you know, I spend a lot of time with them, I hear their voice. It is no different with God. We don't have to see God do something spectacular. We don't have to get some kind of spiritual goosebumps out of revival to encounter God. God is so soft-spoken and humble, He is constantly engaging us in the most subtle ways, in our mundane and routine lives. And I want you to catch that. And God is saying this. God is showing me this. He's leading. God is speaking all the time. And God is revealing opportunities and answers to our prayers constantly. There's a story I once heard about a man who was trying to cl climb on Mount Everest. Right? He was climbing. And then he encountered a storm. So he stopped. And he was hanging sort of by a, a ledge, and he's holding on to his life, waiting for the storm to pass. And of course, he's getting tired, getting tired and tired, and he's thinking, he can't see underneath him, because the storm, he can't see above him. He is literally trapped in the middle. And so he prays, he's like, God, God, just save me this time. If you save me, I'll do anything. Just give me a second chance. I'll go to church, you know, I'll give my life to you, and I'll do anything. And he hears a voice. Just let go. God, I'm serious. Please, just save me just this one time. If you just save me this time, God, I'll give all my money to the church. I'll get, go to church every week. I'll, get, I'll do everything. I'll give my life to missions. Just save me this time. Here's another voice. Let go. I said, God, why don't you hear me? Why don't you hear me? Just this time. He couldn't let go. And the man was found dead, frozen to death, hanging on that tree. And what the founders, the people who found him, uh, discovered was that right underneath him, a 
about five feet below was actually a, a piece of you know, rock that he could have landed on and found security and would have been saved. So the message to let go was exactly what he needed to do to live. That was the answer to his prayer. Let go. It was the hardest thing for him to do because he could not trust the voice. Because my instincts, my senses tell me this is dangerous. This, I might die. That's exactly how God works. If you trust your senses, what you see, what people tell you, what the news or media tell you, what your body, if you trust your senses, then you can never trust God. It's bottom line. Because a person who trusts his senses, right, cannot ever have faith. This is sort of a tangent, but in some ways it's not, because it's very crucial for you to understand this in terms of thinking about your spiritual life, your life of faith, right? Many philosophers and scientists look back at a philosopher named Immanuel Kant and the Enlightenment as a turning point in Western history, a recent turning point in Western history, right, in the 16th century. Why is it a very important turning point? Because until then, until uh, the philosophy of Immanuel Kant, people looked at the world, at least in Europe, right? And, you know, your education, my education is European by, you know, by descent and by history. So, people looked at the world hierarchically from God, God reveals things, and things were very ordered. There was a sense of faith in how they understood and how they gained knowledge of the world around them, how they made sense of life. But many people became skeptical about God and religion, so Immanuel Kant was actually a, a Christian philosopher who was trying to deal with this issue, and so he said, look, let's just divide it up. And let's just say, there are things, right, in the phenomena, you know, you know the word phenomena, right? That's where it comes from. That we just cannot understand. We cannot prove them. We cannot verify them. We can only verify scientifically the things that are the noumena, the things that are, ex you know, uh, experimentally visible and reproducible. Any of you who are in college or even in high school, that's the method by which you learn everything in science, right? You got to be able to reproduce it. If you have a theory, if you have a hypothesis, you got to be able to reproduce the same results. And if the results are consistent enough, you come up with a theory. This is how we understand things about dinosaurs and all kinds of uh, other theories built on evolution. It's really hypothesis that becomes more consistent with theories. So, the, point, the summary and the point of all that is this. That since the Enlightenment, right, man, our verifiable, our sense, our sensory data, right? the things that we can perceive with our senses, with our sight, with, with information, with our, with our reason, that became the norm. That became the standard by which we judge whether something was true or not. And your, your entire education is built on that philosophy. Do you know that? If you, especially if you have a secular education. And so was mine. But the world wasn't, the world didn't operate that way until Immanuel Kant. And if you go to other parts of the world even now, people don't think like that. In the West, we are enslaved to the scientific, right? Uh, to this, what's called the, empir the empirical method of knowledge. For something to be true, I gotta see it for myself. I gotta, it's gotta be proven to me. It's going to be reproduced. That's why Jesus' resurrection cannot be proven. How, how are you going to prove it to me? And there are a lot of problems with this kind of philosophy, this empirical method, that something has to be verified by my senses through tests and through reproduction for it to be true. Because there are many things that are true that I, can, I don't understand, that we benefit from. Right? So many things. When you get on an airplane, you don't understand, well, most people don't understand, unless you're a physics major, right? The, how this plane is flying and carrying me in safely from one place to another. There are a lot of other technologies that we use every day. We have no idea how it works, but we just enjoy it.
that's crucial for you to think about in terms of how do I trust God? Do I need proof? Do I need this sort of reasonable evidence, assurance, before I trust Him? Because you see, if we understand everything about what God is saying, then we would never trust Him anyway. It's because He is greater than me. It's because there is an aspect of Him that I can never understand, that I can just blindly by faith just say, Lord, please help me. Please save me. Please open my eyes. There are these common things, these most obvious things where God is pointing to in your life. Perhaps you're thinking, God, that's too obvious. I, I can't do that. When Jesus told Peter, after a day of being unable to catch any fish, who was an experienced fisherman, he said, cast your net to the other side. It made no sense to him. He's caught no fish all day. And he could have easily argued, Lord, just casting it to the other side is not going to make a difference. There is no fish right now here. I've been here all day. He says that to Jesus. He says, Lord, I've been fishing all day, but because it is you, because it is you, that's the only reason why I'll do it. And he does it. And the catch is so big that the boats are about to sink. You see, that's the message here. And that's the whole point of these miracles. That's why Jesus does this and raises the dead, casts out demons, so that the people there can see who Jesus is. That's the basis of our faith. This Jesus is the Son of God. What other rationale do I need? If He's the Son of God, He can do anything. He can do anything. That's the basis of their faith. I know who Jesus is. I know that this Jesus is no mere prophet. That he is no mere wise man. That this is the Son of God. This is God Himself who has come. He's commanding the storms. He's changing water merely by speaking it. Who is this man? What manner of man is he? People used to say in the New Testament. What manner of man is he? What kind of man is this? That's the basis of their faith. Not some sensory experience. Not some emotional high. Nothing else but that. That's the heart of the faith. If Jesus, Jesus is this kind of man, if this is the Son of God, then anything is possible. Anything. I don't have to understand it. I, don't, I can walk on water if He calls me. And Peter does. That anything is possible in your life if you would trust in Him. That's the basis of faith in Christ. Last thing here. An important point, when the head waiter drinks the wine, he is amazed. He says, why did you save the best wine for last? Usually we give the best wine first so that people can taste it before the palates become dull. And he had no idea that Jesus had performed this miracle again because Jesus is working in the most common, mundane manner. Only the servants knew, only the disciples knew, the inside few. Jesus here is making another statement. Nothing in the Bible is accidental. Nothing is just there, just, just to take up space. He makes this statement that this wine is better. In the beginning I said, this could have been a catastrophe, right? If they ran out of wine, it is not simply a fraternity party where they ran out of kegs of beer. This is a very uh, disgraceful thing. They would have lost face. They would have been humiliated in their community. And it's a picture of what life is like without Christ. It's a picture of what life is like outside of the kingdom of God. In the Old Testament, there are these prophecies and messages about the coming kingdom. And how the coming kingdom, right? Here in Joel chapter 3, verse 18, we read that, In that day the mountains will drip new wine, and the hills will flow with milk. All the ravines of Judah will run with water. A fountain will flow out of the Lord's house and will water the valley of Acacias. There is this anticipation that when Jesus, when this Messiah comes and the kingdom of God comes, the richness right, of God's paradise will be experienced and will be available. The things that we seek in this life by using money, time, energy, our efforts, we're pursuing them, they all, they all fall short. They all fall short of meeting our desires, our expectations that are God-given. 
our desire for love, desire for peace, our desire for glory, for a sense of value and purpose in life, all these other things that are naturally, instinctively with us, they never match up. Otherwise, you know, someone who has, wants money, who makes money, should just stop. They should be content. And they don't. They want more. They're never satisfied, right? Somebody who wants pleasure from exploring, uh, you know, drugs or other things, you would think they'll be satisfied after they've tried a few, but it's not. It's never enough. They, their senses grow dull. They need more and more and more and more. It's no different with every other possible pursuit in life. They never satisfy. They always disappoint. They always fall short. For those of you who are in school, or, you know, many of you, your, one of your highest prior priorities is to get the acknowledgement from your parents, to go to a good school, get a good job, to, sit, to hear them say, I'm proud of you. But it won't end there. That you're going to want the acknowledgement of your peers, of your friends, of your husband, of your future wife. You're going to want to be acknowledged by others. It never ends. But here Jesus begins to reveal that, look, in the kingdom of God, which begins with Jesus, which was introduced with Jesus, you can have this life the way it was meant to be, with true satisfaction, with wine that is the better wine, with friendship that is even better, with a marriage that is whole and perfect, with a sense of purpose and fulfillment that was meant to be the way that God made it. Because when God made Adam and Eve and He made creation, He said, it is good and He blessed it. You can experience it the way it was meant to be. The, the better version of everything you want. The whole and perfect version of everything you desire and seek after in the kingdom of God. And in Jesus Christ, it begins there by first seeing that, who is this man? Who is this Jesus? And being drawn to Him and trusting in Him. And once that faith becomes real and concrete, it is really essentially going from blindness to sight. It is going from low death to life. Where our spirits are dead. So we don't want to, a person who is spiritually dead, you can talk to, talk to death about the kingdom of God. It doesn't make any sense. Jesus was speaking with Nicodemus, a Pharisee, one of the scholars of his day among the Jewish. He was talking about being born again, and, this, and, the, and Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born again? Does he go back into his mother's stomach? He was trying to understand the spiritual reality in biological terms. It doesn't work. You see, he's using his senses. He's using his reason. You cannot understand the things of God just by your intellect. And Jesus says, You are a teacher of Israel, and you don't even understand these things. This is the most basic. He says, I speak to you about earthly things that you don't understand. What if I spoke to you about heavenly things? How will you ever understand? That's why by first coming to faith in Christ, our spirits come alive. The kingdom of God begins to make sense. We begin to see it. We begin to understand it. The words of God begin to penetrate and begin to take hold of me. And they sound sweet. They give me hope. They give me strength. We look forward to worship. We look forward to praising Jesus. We look forward to hearing and teaching and learning the Word of God. These most essential and most basic and most fundamental Christian things begin to make sense. But it only begins there. With you and Jesus. Has your eyes been opened? Has your eyes been opened like these servants and like the disciples? And when you saw the glory of Jesus and you bowed before Him, just like Peter and said, Lord, depart from me, I'm a sinful man. When you bow before Him and say, because of Jesus, you are the Son of God. Unless that has happened to you, you are still in your journey. But you're still not there yet. Because that's the key. That's the key. My sons, though pastor's kids, are not there until they individually come to see who Jesus is and have their eyes open. That is a crossroad that changes everything in life. That is a crossroad that makes this persecuting Saul who is taking Christians and beating them and who is seeing them watch, watching them killed and stoned become the most passionate evangelist the church has ever known to die for this name and this gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, 
this crossroad that you call us to, Lord, to see who Jesus is, is something that we uh, may assume that we hear a lot about, but there are many, even among us, who have not truly encountered Jesus in this life-changing manner. We pray that our eyes will be opened through this series, that many will come to faith and assurance of knowing who Jesus is, the Son of God, who has come to save sinners. And that faith would open up our eyes to the spiritual world of the kingdom of God. May it be, Lord, that many come to this faith through this series. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.